Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us this afternoon and welcome to our Career Week Entrepreneurship Panel. Uh, my name is Colin Talwar, Special Projects Coordinator with the Department of Business and Tourism, and I will be your, your panel moderator for today. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that Mount St. Vincent University is located on Chibuktuk in Mi'kma'ki, the unceded ancestral land of the Mi'kmaq people since time immemorial. This territory is covered by the covenant chain of treaties of peace and friendship signed between 1725 and 1729. 1779. We pay respect to the knowledge embedded in the Mi'kmaq custodians of the lands and waters and to the elders, past, present, and future. We are all treaty people. This event is Learning Passport eligible, just a reminder to everyone here in person and online. And the survey will only be open for 48 hours after the panel discussion ends. So just be mindful of that. Uh, unless you are taking notes or translating, please refrain from using your cell phone. If there is time at the end of the discussion, we will give an opportunity for students to ask questions, be it in person or online. Uh, those of you who are joining us online, you can put your questions in the chat box during the Q&A session at the end, and we will try our very best to get to them. So today, we are joined by Mark, Eduardo, Kathy, Blessing, and Chad. So please join me in welcoming them and giving them a big round of applause. So to start off, uh, I will let each of you briefly introduce yourselves, describe your current position, the organization you work with, et cetera. Uh, why don't we start with Mark? Uh, thank you. Um, Mark Fraser, I am uh, the founder and sole employee of my own independent management consultancy. Uh, I was able to take my dream of uh, firing 300 employees all at once and uh, just working for myself. No, not true. But prior to that, I did. I was running. A, I was a partner in a large uh, IT services shop. But these days, I uh, run this independent management consultancy, focusing on a very specific kind of strategy work, um, and it takes me all over the place. And I have a whole lot of fun doing it. Thanks. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Kathy Monroe, and I'm uh, founder and farm her at uh, Bramble Hill Farm. And so we are a year-round microgreens operation. I'm gonna like, pull some props out here for you. So uh, we're going into our seventh full winter season of growing microgreen salads in a heated greenhouse space, which we sell with all the independent grocery stores throughout the HRM area. And uh, we've maxed capacity. So last year we looked at how we could innovate and uh, move our business in a diff slightly different direction without having to build giant new infrastructure. And so we developed here we go, I'm like pulling a rabbit out of a hat here. Uh, we developed a grow your own product. So everything you need is in the bag, the soil, the seed. And it was really important to me that moving forward with, with new product innovation, not only is it you know, closer to the recycling stream, so it's a number two plastic, but also I think functional packaging is something that we need to really focus on. So the instructions here tell you to cut the bottom off the bag so that you're actually growing in the bag itself. So do that on your kitchen counter, five days to sprout, move it to the windowsill, five to seven days, and you can eat your own salad. And uh, yeah, we have a small team at Bramble Hill in uh, just outside New Glasgow, and excited to be here. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Blessing Owawa. I'm the creative director and owner of DB Pels Designs. Uh, so DB Pels Designs is an Afro-Western fashion brand. Uh, where we blend our designs, blend the best of uh, Western and African fabrics and uh, fashion genre to make beautiful designs for office men and women. So we are focused uh, mainly on uh, women and men in the corporate world. Uh, we dress them, we make blazers, pants. Uh, so like I said, we blend both. Uh, we, we saw the opportunity to introduce colors into uh, the way uh, people in the office dress, and that's the area we are looking into. Uh, so presently, I'm moving into uh, the retail, I'm pivoting towards the retail uh, business fully. So I'm going to open my own uh, shop front, uh, 
the December of this year. And uh, so that's what we are all about. Yeah, I'm a fashion brand. Thank you. Morning, guys. My name is Chad Wisner. I'm a founding partner with a company called LMMW Group which uh, basically is an energy and facility services company. So we operate under two brands, Equilibrium Engineering, which originally was founded in, in Kenful, Nova Scotia about 13 years ago, and L360 is our other brand, which was a, a brand that I started under Lindsay Construction about five years ago as a, a facility optimization and maintenance services annuity revenue type uh, concept, uh, which was bolted on to Lindsay Construction. So. About uh, December of, of 2022, so we're not quite into it for a full year, uh, we decided to break away from the mothership to some degree at Lindsay and um, partnered with uh, the owner of Equilibrium Engineering and, and another colleague at Lindsay and we created an independent company in partnership with Lindsay Construction and, and ourselves, of course, uh, to create this new entity. So our whole concept is providing um, the front end, which is the discovery, where we go in and look at a building, we figure out how it's performing, we do energy models, we do energy feasibility studies and facility condition assessments. Then we come out with a nice document that says, here's what it looks like, here's what you have to do. And then we can leverage our partners to actually implement those projects. So whether that's a deep energy retrofit of mechanical equipment or fixing windows, roof, uh, building envelope sort of repairs, we can put all of that in place, project manage it through the cycle, and then at the end we have our maintain phase, which is where we go in and put them into an annuity um, maintenance program where we come back and do physical inspections of the facility maybe twice a year, help them look after various systems in the building and help the building perform better. And the whole concept is around making buildings perform better and reducing emissions and reducing energy costs for our clients. So that's basically in a nutshell our company. Hello guys, my name is Eduardo Haber, j in English. I am the owner, founder of Verano, a restaurant downtown Halifax. I am Mexican and I have a Venezuelan wife, so we have uh, infused Venezuelan Mexican cuisine. And we've been open for almost eight years. Uh, very tough path to walk, if you ask me. Uh, first time business owner. Uh, so you know what happened a couple of years ago or so. Um, we also started an, another small business called Holly Pops, which we make gourmet uh, popsicles, uh, fruit-based only. So it's a vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free uh, product, uh, high-quality gourmet popsicles. And we learned a lot from it. We've been enjoyed both uh, companies, uh, small companies, to be honest. And we are working on keeping that uh, authenticity that we had gotten from Verano and expressing ourselves as being Mexican and Venezuelan together and also being able to create a larger product with the popsicles uh, and still maintain high quality uh, that we can offer to a um, wider range of people in Halifax for now. Thank you very much. That's awesome. We looks like we definitely have a variety of very different businesses represented on the panel, so that's awesome. Uh, for our next question, uh, did you always plan on becoming an entrepreneur? What profession or industry did you see yourself in when you graduated high school or post-secondary school? So why don't we start with blessing and then um, anyone can feel free to jump in. Thank you for that question. Uh, so uh, my background is actually education. Um, I was an elementary teacher for four years after my undergrad. Uh, so, but I've always, I've always loved fashion. Yeah, since I was a child, I always lo loved to dress and see people dress and always dress people as well. So uh, after um, uh, working in the school for about four years, I saw the need to actually pursue what I really want to do mm -hmm. yeah, in life. And then I went to uh, fashion schools uh, for like about two years back home in Nigeria because that's my country of uh, origin. So I did that for two years and then in 2017, early 2017, I opened my own fashion outfit yeah, in Nigeria. So I relocated here with my family in 2020 and um, I actually, uh, when I was coming, I, I was thinking I would be able to like uh, 
do my master's side to side with running my brand as well. But I saw it wasn't really easy because mm -hmm. I have two little children that need my attention as well. Uh, we're running the brand. So I decided to focus solely on running the business and getting it to the height I want before uh, probably uh, making, I mean, bl blending it with something else, yeah, which I will still pursue because. Uh, uh, I, see, I want to get to my. I want to get my brand to a situation whereby I'll be able to train people as well. So for now, I'm still growing the business. Like I said, I'm pivoting towards retail fully. Uh, so when I get the business to a stage where it can run on its own without me not fully being on ground 100%, then I can like spread my wings and do other things that I really wanted, like uh, getting the necessary education. Uh, in educational leadership and all that, yeah. That's the uh, place I am right now. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, anyone else? Feel free. <laughs> no particular order. So when I was in high school, I didn't like school. That's the truth. And um, I come from a family where uh, my grandma had to stay at home and she was always cooking so my mom could go out for working and her cooking was amazing and always the compliment when mom came back home is like hey you should open a restaurant uh, that dream uh, came to myself and uh, when I finished high school I had no idea what I wanted to do so I went to tourism school a very like general view of tourism and then I started working on a restaurant because I knew I had to do a co-op that was not gonna be paid for. So I was like, I'm not working for free, so I'm starting a job, so when I have to do my co-op, I'm getting paid already for it. And I fell in love with the restaurant business. Uh, I became, uh, then I moved to Canada and I did kitchen management in uh, Centennial College in Toronto. And worked in many restaurants, and I just knew that restaurants was everything that I was enjoying and I could do it for free. So basically, uh, one of the advices my mom gave me is like, find a job that you don't need to be paid for, and then the money will be extra. It works, but also it's not a profitable advice, let me tell you. Um, after that, I always knew I wanted to do something. Like, uh, I'm a very independent, positive kind of person, so I knew I wanted something of my own, and I wasn't too worried about if, how is this gonna work. So eventually, my wife and I, we worked together in opening a restaurant, uh, we venture and we say, I think it's going to work, and here we are. So it, it, it is a, a very general, not directional path that I took, like it was like step by step. But I, now that I look back, I see how my personality and not being afraid of the challenge, plus enjoying what I did and what I still do, it's what has kept me alive in the business so far. So I had a little bit of a, a weirder way to this. I, I uh, joined the Bachelor of Business Administration program at Mount St. Vincent University in uh, 1991. Well, I'm an old man. I'm 50. Um, anyway, did my first year. Did okay. It was all right. I, I liked the Mount. It was good. My aunt went here, and I grew up in the Valley. I was self-sufficient, kind of came up here, put myself through school. And after my first year, I said, man, this sucks. I hate this so much. I didn't enjoy the accounting classes. I didn't enjoy all these things. It's ironic. You end up coming full circle at some point. So anyway, I, I got out of business and I, I went into a Bachelor of Arts, a major in history, because my objective was to become a teacher because I really wanted job security and, and that sort of thing. And I said, well, that would be okay. I love history. I love politics and, you know, a business is okay. But for now, this is more what I want to do. So anyway, so I ended up doing that. Uh, for another year and uh, then met my wife at the Mount. Uh, she's now, we've been married for 30 years, or 28 years, so again, I'm an old man. Um, we stayed together and I started working. So I went to the Mount uh, part-time until I graduated in 1999. So it took me a little longer to get my degree. In the meantime, I got working and, and moved into some management roles um, on the retail side and then worked my way into uh, international exporting. And uh, next thing you know, you kind of realize that maybe I am an entrepreneur and uh, taking the, uh, you know, the, the corporate way or, or working in a school and so on maybe wasn't for me at the time. So anyway, I started getting into business and, and um, 
quickly realized that I was pretty decent at it and uh, ran a, a small uh, lobster export business for about four years and um, progressively kept going from there and said, okay, now I need to get in the corporate world to learn some more. Took some more courses in marketing from uh, a, a few different universities over the year that my employer paid for, which was awesome. And uh, I played in a band, so we had a lot of fun on that, all that stuff. And then um, the entrepreneurial bug really bit me, and, and that's kind of where I got to where I am today. It's, it's been a progression of constantly uh, working on those ideas and trying to find um, financial feasible ways of doing it. And, and uh, that's how I got to where I am here. Well, I feel highly undereducated and, and a completely accidental entrepreneur. Uh, I have a fisheries background, actually, graduated from the University of Manitoba, worked in fisheries for about 10 years all over the north. And actually, what the question was when you were a kid or coming out of high school, I was a National Geographic freak, and that's what I wanted to do, was I wanted to do science, and I wanted to be collecting data, and, uh, and I really felt very fulfilled doing that. We moved back to Nova Scotia, and I had some challenges actually getting employment in fishery science here. Um, ended up working as fish hatcheries, wasn't what I wanted. Anyway, we, I ended up having, we had a family, and as I was on maternity leave from my position at fisheries that I did eventually get here, uh, we bought an old homestead. So we bought an old apple orchard, and before I knew it, we had big gardens and pigs and chickens and all those things that, you know, they say chickens are the gateway animal and all the rest. Yeah, all the rest happened too. <laughs> and, and so when it came to my, our second child and I was supposed to go back to my fisheries position, realized that we had created a lifestyle that wasn't going to be sustainable for two of us to be working away from home. At that point, I was traveling a little more for work. And so we said, well, let's just maybe let's take a little extra time and stay at home. But very quickly, the gardens were just so big and there was so much bounty. I was selling it to the neighbors and somebody said, you should go to the farmer's market. And then I was at the farmer's market and I realized what I really loved was talking to people and being in front of people and telling them my story and sharing what I had created and, you know, with their lives. So I started off in mixed vegetables and, uh, and did that for a year. And my employer actually let me take an extended leave of absence. And that was the government at the time. And then uh, when we decided, you know, well, Kathy, you stay home. And if you make a little extra on the side, that's, that's good to help. But stay home with the kids for the moment. And uh, my husband threw me a retirement party, which looking back on was like completely the opposite of actually what it was. <laughs> it was the beginning of a much bigger journey. And... Uh, so, very, so the New Glasgow Farmer's Market at the time was building a year-round building, and that first winter, there was nothing. There was no fresh produce available, you know, a little bit of garlic and some potatoes and squash. And so the opportunity presented itself to me. It was like, what can I bring that's fresh, consumable, that people want locally produced? And at the time, I did a lot of research and started growing microgreens. Before I knew it, my kid's playroom was completely taken over with racks and lights and all this and so, and selling out every weekend at the farmer's market. And I said, well, I think there's something to this. So my husband said, well, you got to move it out of the house. <laughs> this is not sustainable. And uh, we ran a very successful Kickstarter, actually, selling shares to our community. They backed us up. We built this greenhouse facility and that's the story yeah so kind of an mm -hmm. accidental you know what you I have a mentor right now who said to me the other day she's like always make margin for the magic because you really don't know if you don't leave that little extra space wiggle room to see you'll you'll miss out on the opportunity awesome can I give you some consultant speak <laughs> where there's mystery there's margin yeah, so uh, keep the mystery in it. And I think the, 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 the other lesson here, if you haven't figured it out already, is there's no single path to success as an entrepreneur. Um, I didn't want to be an entrepreneur when I graduated from high school or even university. I was going to be a doctor, for sure. Um, and my first kick at that, it went, I, I was close, but didn't do it. But that's okay, because I had a... I had already been accepted to a theology program where I was going to do a lay program in theology because my shtick to get in med school was going to be faith is half of healing. Um, it kind of dawned on me if I needed a shtick to get into med school, maybe I should do something different. And I also was realizing at the time uh, I was living in Toronto and I was I had just taken on a job as a temp marketing person that um, 
in the world I was that I'd been currently been working in, I, I could be creative that afternoon. Whereas something like medicine is 20 years of work before you can express creativity and be, you know, be you know be taken seriously. So I'm also an accidental entrepreneur. I didn't set out to do this. Um, but what uh, what I uh, realized later is that. You know, creativity was what drew me into founding my my own my, my first business, which was a small marketing communications firm that you know, my partner and I grew to about uh, um, about fifteen, and then we sold it to a technology firm that uh, uh, that we continued to operate. Uh, that was that three hundred person firm I was telling you about. Um, now I'm back to just me, and uh, I think that reflecting on that. I, I, I wish I could have known that you could have a, you know, a career as just a problem solver, because I really that that's kind of what I do is is I help I help companies figure weird things out, um, and that is so inspiring. And I and I, I, I wake up every day, even you know I'm a Chad, I'm an old guy too, um, feeling excited to do what I do, and uh, that is that is something that entrepreneurs know. Um, it's not without risk. Um, my risk, my business is less risky than yours, uh, the restaurant, goodness, um, but uh, definitely is a different kind of fulfillment. Thanks. Okay. For our next question, uh, what was your motivation for starting your business and why did you choose to start the business that you did? Uh, so why don't we start with Kathy? Well, I think I kind of answered that in a roundabout way. Yeah, it was uh, it was really a lifestyle choice in the beginning. It was going to fit our family needs, and then uh, and then very much um, it it was a bug, right? Like once we got a little taste of like, oh, this could be something bigger. This could we could build something out of this. Um, yeah, it uh, it it kind of spiraled from there. Can you repeat the question again? Oh, for sure, for sure. Uh, what was your motivation? <clears throat> Sorry. What was your motivation for starting your business and why did you choose to start the business that you did? Yeah, like I said, there was an opportunity, right? And, uh, and I grabbed that at the moment. And it was interesting, I was at Saltscapes Expo this weekend and somebody referred to Bramble Hill Farm as the OG of microgreens. And I was like, what? And uh, yeah, going into seven years of business is actually quite a long time for a small business. And, uh, and a lot of them come and go in the in-betweens. and. Uh, Anyone? <laughs> um, uh, so the current business I'm in, one of the main reasons that we started it and, and truly founded it from the ground up is, is that I got a lot of exposure to what's going on with climate change right now and, and the policies and the things that are coming from the federal government, the things you're hearing on the news every day and all of that, um, to the point where we were doing uh, under my L360 division at Lindsay, we were doing um, building condition assessments. We were doing construction. We were actually putting um, things into place around existing stock of buildings that's out there. So I was learning a lot, and I was kind of a one-man show for a while, building it from the ground up and building my team from the ground up, relying on a subcontractor network and our own internal resources that I could pull into our little group. But what I realized quickly was that nobody in the market was out there actually helping building owners um, decarbonize a building, but also aware of the fact that the reason they want to decarbonize mostly is to save costs. So long-term costs to make it more sustainable. And there was no company out there that did everything from the discovery through the implementation through the maintenance piece. And so that's where the concept came up was that we, we had an opportunity here in this market specifically to leverage our business networks that we built during the course of our careers and my partners together, and also to do something that gives meaningful action to addressing the issues of climate change and so on, which is actually, um, pardon my language, but get shit done is what we often say, is that you can put all the feasibility studies and all the reports that you want in the world in front of people, and that's what's been going on. And a lot of companies take it, they put the binder on the desk, and, and that's the end of it, because they don't know what to do next. So what we help people do is, is, is take them to that next step and say, let's put a project in place that works for your budget, for your need, and we'll help you look after it and maintain it. Because 
they're running their business. They don't know how to run a building or, or how to decarbonize or, or anything like that. So that's what drew me into that. So, yep. Sorry, can I add to mine? Because I missed the mark on that. It, it yeah. really was the passion to talk to people and realizing that I have something to offer to serve someone else, right? And bringing that forward. So, like, especially with the grow your own kits, this is super exciting to me because I think everybody should do a little bit of this themselves. Yeah, you're not going to feed your family of four with a little tray of microgreens on your windowsill, but if you've never grown anything before, like, it just helps people um, build that confidence that they can have a little bit of control over their own food systems. And, uh, and so it was, all, it, what drove me to it was the passion to bring something and serve other people. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs feel exactly that way. Absolutely. I'll go next. Uh, three things. Uh, one is passion, my passion for fashion. Uh, second is an opportunity to solve uh, a problem. And third is, of course, to make money. So uh, I'll explain briefly on those three points. So uh, I've always loved fashion since I was a child. So when the time came for me to go fully into it, I seized the opportunity. And secondly, uh, so I'm going to like say a little story. So when I came to Canada in uh, winter, yeah, that was February of uh, 2020. I wanted a colorful coat, like mm -hmm. a winter jacket. I went to the stores. I couldn't see anything I like. So I decided to, like, ask around where the fabric store is here. I was directed to Fabric View. I went to get a wool, and then I brought some African prints from Africa when I was coming. So I bought my machine immediately from Singer, and I put, I, I made something I love. Mm -hmm. And... I still love to wear, and that same coat, I've replicated it for like probably 10 people because they love how elegant it is. So that was where the idea to start fusing uh, both Western and African prints came from. And uh, one thing I discover here uh, is that a lot of people actually love colors, mm -hmm. but they don't want to wear like overwhelming colors. So people just, just want it to like be a little bit in their clothing. and. Uh, Color, color is actually known to kind of increase productivity and all that. So it's, I saw that opportunity and I seized it, and that was what birthed my business here. And uh, like I said, also to make money, I feel that it's something that I can grow to a sustainable business mm -hmm. that will be, uh, what's the word now, that will last a lifetime. So that's my story. Sure, I'll go. Uh, in my current business, so Blessing was just speaking about market opportunity. Uh, the work I'm doing today, um, the vast majority, I don't know if you would learn this in your business class, but the vast majority of companies out there completely suck at strategy. And so the, the, I have an a endless market opportunity to, to help organizations connect strategy with execution. The other thing, too, is that I have a unique way of doing that, and that's allowed me to break from the traditional time and materials billing system that most consulting organizations would have, and I, and I charge what I believe I'm worth, uh, which is more than an hourly rate. And so my decision to structure my current business this way was really to combine what I love to do with the knowledge that I have that is that is different from others in the marketplace um, with an endless stream of potential customers um, and it, I didn't set out to do that this is hard it's hard to do but uh, that came to me in a way that um, that was smooth and it's uh, I would I would challenge you to think about that you know like it, 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 the market has to be there um, you've got to, you, and you've got to be able to figure out well, what is different about you, and, uh, and so I, I think about those things as you as you consider your own your own business uh, business futures. So, for me, it was kind of like predestined in a way from like my childhood. I already had this dream starting, even I was not fully conscious about it. Uh, when I got into the culinary world, um, there are many paths that you can take, that you can grow, uh, and all of them seem attractive to me. I, I, I didn't uh, dislike one or the other. Uh, but as uh, it's been like already been said, like a lot has to do with your lifestyle, with your 
uh, decisions. In my case, I was uh, married at a young age, and uh, I value my marriage over my career in some way. So if, if you wanted to be a chef and you wanted to work in like these uh, fine dining restaurants where I worked in the past, then marriage was a very difficult thing to sustain. Uh, eventually, I was led by this lifestyle to work for a retirement house, which was very boring to me, the idea, but the money was very attractive, and uh, with a family that I wanted to create, it was a decision that I made at the time. Best job I ever had. Uh, I was given all the freedom that uh, another job has given me, uh, with creativity and the ingredients and the access to tools and so on with all the uh, excitement the restaurants offered back to me. Um, so when I, when, I, when I finished this uh, job, because we moved to Nova Scotia uh, through my job, my wife's job, I was like, I already had all this freedom, which I already know I'm not gonna have anymore. Uh, so for me, the next step is to create my own freedom. And we decided that yes, we're gonna open our own restaurant. I Meanwhile, I took all kinds of jobs from like moving companies to like working for other restaurants or and other like retirement houses um, until I was able to start a, our own restaurant. And at the time, still, uh, the restaurant has been focused in how can it be sustained with my family's lifestyle. And that means we are one of the only restaurants that do not open for dinner or weekends. And in the, uh, industry world that's kind of crazy. You have a restaurant downtown Halifax and you don't open on the weekends or at night. Uh, but if I did it, then probably my family wouldn't be successful at this time. And then that's kind of like give me the safe space to continue to work. So it's been a slow growth, but it's been healthy in that way that uh, I'm still healthy. I'm still enjoying the lifestyle that I decided to have. And we can continue to, to get our work in this it's great like hearing all of your individual stories and how everyone it's an eclectic group of motivation right to start your own business it's really really nice um, next question we have what are the advantages and or disadvantages as you see them to being an entrepreneur and let us start with Chad great um, so the advantages, I guess, is that you set your own destiny. And one thing I've heard from everybody is that creativity is a big part of it. Um, one thing I would say that's important is um, being flexible, being willing to learn, being willing to really learn the business that you're in. And, um, you know, that it, being an entrepreneur gives you flexibility. It gives you a bit of financial security if it's a good business. Sometimes it's not a good business and you have to pivot and, and change and go on to something else. Um, so that is an advantage for sure. Disadvantage is that you worry about it all the time. You have payroll, you have uh, people that depend on you, you have uh, benefits, uh, plans that you have to deliver to your employees, you have people asking for bonuses and all these other things all the time. So it's, it's something you have to learn that's a necessary part of it all. But that whole point of being flexible has led me down this path and, and I'll, I'll go back just a little bit to you know I took a job with uh, SureShot Dispensing Systems back uh, around 2001 um, as uh, director of sales and knew nothing about the business it's manufacturing but you know our customers were Tim Hortons, Starbucks and Dunkin Donuts and so on interesting business learned a lot and I found that I really enjoyed marketing so you know I added director of marketing title onto that and we kept moving and doing brand marketing and and then I left and started my own business doing uh, brand strategy and, and marketing, and I really enjoyed that. But I realized, you know, gee, you know, it's one of my customers ended up really benefiting from what I was doing, and that got me into telecommunications. So I, I became a partner and a part owner with Cabco Communications for a while until we sold the business together with my partner. But it's interesting that it's a wobbly path, and uh, the common denominator has always been be very creative and, and plot a course forward, come up with new ideas. I like the idea of being able to brand it and having the ability to create something new and, and create a new um, product or service and a price point and, and to do something that uh, is never been done before is really fun. And it's kind of led me down a weird path to where I am today, but 
um, I think my advice to anybody is that it's, it's nice to chart your own course as an entrepreneur, but it's also really trust your creative instincts and, and ask for help and really listen. And that listening is at the every level of a business. So that would be the technician that's building a piece of equipment or the person that's sweeping the floor in, in a plant or, or whatever. Like, listen to everybody and learn from it and be willing to get your hands dirty. And you'll get a lot more respect out of your coworkers and you'll get a lot better productivity out of your, of your coworkers as well if they respect you. And that's been a, a big part of, of, I think, my success to date in, in uh, business. Uh, both are very important. Uh, the benefits of being an entrepreneur are definitely independence and there's a sense of self-fulfillment that it's very difficult to get uh, from a paid job uh, per se. Uh, and I know this, for example, with my family. My wife still has a full-time job with IBM and um, although she is really successful on what she does, uh, it is, uh, in, in the personal level, it's like all this corporate world is, is not fulfilling her. Um, but there's security there. Like, you know, like, bi-weekly there's going to be an income that's going to come. You know how much is going to come, and you can count, budget, do whatever you want with that. Um, uh, another benefit that you can get is that you get to create your own path you get to uh, uh, put your own goals. Uh, so there's not gonna come, no one's gonna come and tell you what to do and when to do it. But that's also a blessing and a curse. No one tells you what to do and when to do it. It's all on your shoulders. If you don't push yourself, no one's gonna come and tell you, hey, you should, you should do better than this. Um, so you become more accountable for things, responsible, and when things don't work, it's you, you get no one to blame but yourself. I mean, you can you can say, well, because the government did this or society is doing that or whatever you want to say, like COVID. Uh, it's up to you to lift that weight up and decide what to do, how hard to work. Um, so that idea, I think, I think it's pretty common knowledge nowadays that being a entrepreneur doesn't mean you don't get to work because you get to work probably double or triple. Uh, but it's, it's, it's both of them at the same time, and I guess it all depends on your own uh, personality and how hard you're willing to work and how much fulfillment you get from that. If you are only looking for um, freedom in life and uh, something more stable, uh, it's very difficult you're going to get it from this. But if you're looking to build something that you can feel proud of and that you know that you have the skills and the decision making uh, that can, can fulfill this, then definitely is the way to go. Yeah, uh, for me, I kind of believe that entrepreneurship as just like the other speaker said, uh, so many disadvantages and so many advantages and that's why i always tell people that i speak with to always have passion for whatsoever you're doing so that when the going gets tough you know the reason why you started that and then you can you have a reason to continue it so uh it's tough being an entrepreneur ex especially when uh when you're just trying to start yeah as it as you go further, it tends to become more stable. But starting is always very, very challenging. So it's always uh, the right, I mean, when you want to start, please and please, what I always tell people, have love what you do. Love it because it's not going to be a smooth journey. No matter what, there will be downtime, there will be times that you feel on top of the world. Everything is going well the the what's it called the papers are balancing everything is good but there will be sometimes for example the time of covid uh, just look at uh, a lot of people run at a loss and all that but i believe that uh what kept most people going was their passion for what they are doing and then they were able to bounce back so 
no matter the advantage, I mean, no matter the disadvantages, make sure that you love what you do and you put in your 100% in it. Eventually, it's going to work out. Yeah. I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll say pretty much the same thing as you did. The highs can be very, very high, and the lows can be you never thought you could feel that far down. Um, but if you started it with passion, you'll find a way back up out of that and you will you'll reach another peak you never even thought possible. So I feel like it's just putting that one foot in front of the other consistently day after day over a long time. Success, when you see somebody that's successful, it never happened overnight, yeah. right? It was a long journey with a lot of tears. <laughs> um, but for me personally, starting um, based on, you know, creating a lifestyle for my family that I wanted. Right now, my, uh, my daughter is uh, just turning 13, and um, she's been going to a few different trade shows and things with me. And a couple of weeks ago, we were at an event, and I was like, I got to sneak off, go use the washroom. And I came back around the corner, and she is like full on pitching the business to a customer. And I just stood off to the side and had this little mom moment, and it was just so amazing that you know, raising my children in my business and them seeing what I have created for our family and then seeing them build their confidence in that as well um, and finding themselves. And, and for us, it was creating a healthy lifestyle that I hope will lead them through whatever they choose to do with their lives. Um, yeah, I, I would not say that being an entrepreneur is for the faint of heart at all. <laughs> yeah, the only other thing I would add to that is um, along, it would be along those lines, like on the risk side of things. Um, but to mitigate against that, and this may not be a popular opinion with many employers out there, there's nothing wrong with figuring out your business while you have a job. Especially if it's a job that you can, you're doing well and you've got some space to be able to think about what's next. Use that, those moments to, to get some stuff figured out so that you're not, you know, it's not a scramble to get revenue or you don't have to, um, you don't have to, you know, sell yourself short or cut your price or whatever it happens to be just to get money in the door. If you've got the stability of a, of a job that pays well, that you can kind of keep your head down, use that to your advantage. If it's in your core to want to be an entrepreneur. There's, from one entrepreneur to another, there's nothing wrong with that. Can I just jump on that one? That's a good point. Is, is that, um, you know, you can be very creative within an organization as well that you get hired for. And, um, you know, what I've done, every position I've ever had within a company has been my own creation. And based on, hey, I think we could do the, don't be afraid to speak up as the idea speak up if you have a good idea work on it your colleagues can help you and you can still have that steady paycheck i have three children and you know lots of bills and i, I couldn't afford to just go out on my own and take a, a huge risk um, but you know to be able to work through an organization and present ideas and leverage um, what you think might be possible you'd be surprised a lot of ceos and and business owners are very receptive to helping you achieve that and uh, you can actually launch whole product lines. You can do all kinds of neat stuff within your organization, but no one's gonna do it for you. You have to advocate for yourself and you have to chart your path because if you wait for that promotion, it, it may not come. That, that's pretty common. So I would say be, be confident, don't be cocky, but <laughs> come speak up. I think that's the key. People wanna hear your ideas and if they see you have ideas, they're gonna want to help you. For sure, yeah. So interesting, now I might drive here, I was thinking about this and uh, very same line of thought. Um, whatever you do in the future right now, uh, next month, uh, please take whatever we're able to share with you for your own path, whether you decide to be a full entrepreneur full time or you decide to do it, uh, a chat say you wanna do it uh, through being an employee for someone else, you have to know how to value yourself, be confident enough to value yourself and sell that not only to customers, but maybe an, an employer 
Uh, so that way, uh, you, you value yourself over anything else, over a paycheck, uh, because life is like that. You need security, and there's nothing wrong about like, hey, you know what, this is what I do, this, those, these are my assets, these are my skills, and I'm gonna sell them, whether to a customer or an employer, but I know what I, what I have to offer, and eventually that can lead you to, like it did to myself, I did it to many restaurants, and I sell myself as a chef, and as a kitchen manager, and as a restaurant manager, and eventually I was able, with all of that experience that someone else paid for, being able to say, hey, I'm gonna open my restaurant now because I know what mistakes not to make anymore. So, yeah, good advice. Yeah, thank you all for giving such wonderful advice and gemstones with uh, your experience. I'm sure everyone is taking it in. <laughs> um, Okay, so if you had to restart your career as an entrepreneur, would you do anything differently? And we're gonna start with uh, Eduardo, if you're okay with that. 100%. Uh, so one of the mistakes that I made when I started, it was like, um, and I'm gonna talk about my entrepreneurial experience, not all of my working experience, is that I undervalue uh, myself and I did uh, undersell my products. Um, reason why is like I came to a place where there was already a lot of uh, competition and I was like, how do I distinguish myself from them? I'm gonna offer high quality uh, products cooking. Um, so I, I still keep pride on doing that and I'm gonna continue until I work. But I sold it to a very low price. And people were like, well, I can say no to that because it's high quality, it's healthy, it's authentic, and it's cheaper than going anywhere else. Great, right? No. Uh, seven, almost eight years later, it has taken me a lot of work to actually ask for the money that I know I deserve to be asking for. Because I cannot just like double my prices overnight. Uh, that will definitely put me out of business because people are gonna get angry about it. So I have to be now be conscious about like, I need to increase my prices while the economy is going crazy and everything's getting more expensive. So, so now I have a lot of work to do to recover from my initial uh, decisions. Um, I still think you have to be conservative and don't overvalue yourself, but definitely don't put yourself under because if you wanna go higher, eventually you're gonna have to work really hard to get where you want to be. So that, that would be my advice. Um, what I would do differently is, I guess it's, um, it's more around understanding what works for me and what I'm really interested in. I think the advantage you guys have today is that there's way more resources like this forum. There's a lot more things out there, I think, today that you can really evaluate what gets you going, what you're interested in, than there was maybe 20 years ago. Um, you know, today, I might even take a trade for about two years and be a carpenter and figure out what the hell is going on in, in the world out there of, of building houses and, and doing all these things that are out there in the world that if you get really good at something and have a skill, you're so much more valuable in a lot of ways. And, you know, university is an important part of that to give you the skills that you need to run that business and to understand the finances. I think that's super critical, which is where a lot of tradespeople go wrong and they end up working for a company forever and, and don't really love it. I think there's, there's a lot of crooked paths to success, but really understanding what you're interested in is really important. If you're a creative person and you enjoy marketing, then go in that direction, great. If you're unsure, don't waste a lot of money like I did for a while on just Man, do I want to do this? Do I want to do that? You know, it, it's a it's a crooked path sometimes. So really, give your be honest with yourself and figure out what you want to do. Jump in. Uh, one thing that I would do differently. Two things actually is uh, I'll try as much as possible to find a mentor. Yeah, because uh, getting a mentor that can lead you right, it helps you to avoid making some very silly mistakes, let me put it that way, because they've walked that path and they can guide you on the right path to follow. So you're not making the same mistakes they made and your journey is kind of smoother. So that's one thing I would do. Coaching and mentorship is a very 
uh, serious aspects of business that I believe that uh, people should take serious before starting their own journey. Yeah. And the good thing is uh, you can, you don't have to like have a direct mentor. You can have like an indirect mentor. Look, uh, when you click on uh, YouTube these days, you see so many resources that can help you uh, to before you start your own business. So that's one thing. Um, and uh, the second thing, kind of lost my line of thoughts. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, the second thing that I think I will uh, do differently, yeah, I remember now, is to not try to do everything myself. Yeah, a lot of us believe that we can take on so many things and not get tired. Yeah, that's one thing I learned the hard way. Yeah, try as much as possible to outsource. Give it to professionals that can do it. You don't have, have to be the uh, producer, uh, the the cashier and everything that you that the, the marketer the one to do everything when there are people that can do these things and do it at a very affordable fee for you so try as much as possible to get help when you need to so that number one you don't break down and number two you have time for other things in your life yeah that would be my advice If I was going to change anything, I would uh, reach out for help sooner with all the different organizations and professional groups that there are, like the Center for Women in Business. Um, I actually just became a certified diverse supplier through uh, WEBI, which is Women Business Enterprise. Like getting connected with Taste of Nova Scotia, if that's what you're in, in a food industry. Um, as soon as you possibly can, network in those groups because there are so many people in your corner you don't even know it I feel like I was a very lonely entrepreneur for quite a few years and just thought I had to hustle it out on my own and once I started getting more doing spending more time networking realizing that that's how so many people feel and you don't have to feel that way <laughs> so get connected I would change that I would get connected as soon as I possibly can in those different um, associations. Um, the one thing I wouldn't change personally for me, but it's just my personality type, is that I jumped into something that I didn't know and I like to learn on the go so that I could really pivot and change and figure it out. But I wouldn't have been able to do that without outsourcing some of the things I really didn't know about because I have no business background and hiring great people like this guy um, for consulting, right? Reach out, outsource those needs you need in financing or marketing, if that's not your background and specialty, um, don't feel like you have to do it all on your own. The, oh, great stuff, struggling to figure out what to add here, but I think that maybe uh, one of the key points is that being an entrepreneur, like if that's not your job, it's, it's a way of life. And it's quite likely that as an entrepreneur, your first business is not gonna be your last. So you absolutely will figure out ways to do things differently. Um, it's just, it'll be in, in your nature. I would offer one bit of advice though, um, that just to kind of put it in the th thematically with some other points that were mentioned here. If you've got a great idea, like you think is this is a mind blowing idea, do not keep it to yourself. Like your idea inside your brain can't grow nearly as fast as it can if you share your idea. So do not worry about people stealing your idea. They might steal the words you use, but they're not gonna steal the idea. Like there's, the, like there's so much more to it. Your peer group, your advisors, mentors, uh, classmates, they can offer some superb advice on your idea to allow you to, to grow faster. Don't, uh, don't think you have to hold it in as a secret to save the world, it's, your idea needs to be nurtured in public. I add one more thing, don't kind of add on to that, don't ever be afraid of competition. It's the best thing and it took me so many years of being fearful of like, somebody else is doing the same thing as me, like oh no, there's not enough space. There is always enough space because no one is ever gonna replicate your story, right? And as long as you are being passionate and authentic and bringing forward whatever product or service it is, that it's only a benefit to have competition because they push you to do better and strive more and bring awareness if it's a product-based business. So, 
that's something I wish I would have felt that and knew that earlier because I feel like I did live in a little bit of entrepreneurial fear in my loneliness. Okay, so for our last question, uh, what advice do you have for university students who may be thinking about starting their own business? Uh, let's start with Chad. Well, one of the things I would say for sure, and, and it kind of got mentioned about having a mentor, but I would say, you know, join a, a, a business group or a, try to get on a committee through a business group. Maybe it's through the Chamber of Commerce or something like that, but, um, you know, join a board. The people that you meet on these boards and, and these committees and these associations um, can be and it can surely almost change your life. You know, some of the people I've met have become business partners, uh, they've become customers, um, they like what you're doing, they take you under their wing, they might even finance you to, to get your idea to market. But you need that kind of mentor of, of experienced people in a good, solid network um, around that. And without your network, it's very hard to break into certain markets. Um, so it's, it's become very important in, in my, my life for sure and, and uh, getting to me to where I am today. The other thing I would say is, is uh, do everything with integrity. Um, be very honest. Be a good person. Um, there's people I dealt with years and years ago that suddenly have become my customers today. As they remember back in the day when we blah, blah, blah. You know, never burn a bridge. Always, uh, always try to be a good person. Uh, be honest and reach out for help and you don't know it all and you know you won't be successful right away. There's unicorns that come out and they sell all the, oh look I did this startup and look at me now and I'm driving a Porsche. It's not going to happen probably. Um, maybe it will, but probably not. So just just be honest with everyone and yourself and, and remember who you work with. They're helping you as, as much as you are bringing things forward. So. Uh, but do get a mentor. I really like that idea. It's one regret I will say I didn't have for a long time was a good mentor uh, to help me avoid some of the mistakes that, that I made, and uh, as an entrepreneur particularly. And, and you've, you learn from it over the years, and, and it arms you with a, that information that uh, maybe I didn't know. So, I want to say uh, right now for me personally too, and, and I think you should take this away, is find a way to hush the hustle because as an entrepreneur, a lot of us are so driven, it's really hard to turn it off. And there's, you know, you've blurred the lines because you've choos chosen to be an entrepreneur as a lifestyle. And so you're bringing it home with you. It's with you all the time when you wake up and go to bed, maybe you're having a nice dinner with your partner. You're still often in that mindset, right? Because it's just part of who you are. So find something in your life that has absolutely nothing to do with your business. And when you do that thing, really hush the hustle, like tell it to shut up and do your thing. I, uh, the last couple of years have been driven to do some um, endurance sports and that is like when you, I put myself into a physical place of life-threatening event, I can't think about anything else, right? So that's my hush the hustle and uh, so find your thing, whether it's yoga or reading a good book and walking your dog, like it doesn't have to be something crazy and extreme, just make sure you're doing something for yourself. Yeah, I would like to say uh, one quote I believe so much in is uh, by Bo Bonnet. Yeah, yeah, that's his name. He said, uh, success is who you are, not what you have. So that's what, one thing that has kept me going this uh, entrepreneur journey for a very long time. Uh, like what Chad said, that uh, be a good person. Yeah, when you give positivity, uh, the universe has a way of bringing positivity back to you. So, so as much as possible, try to do everything with integrity, with transparency, and let your, uh, let your product or services you're offering speak for itself. Make sure that everything you're doing, you're doing it genuinely, and you're doing it with, uh, with, 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 uh, what's the word now? I'm trying to look for the right word. Make sure everything you're doing, you're doing it from your heart. Uh, it has a way of showing forth in the product you you uh, you sell. When you do, when you do everything from your heart, it has a way of showing even in the service you render. So that's one thing. Be a good person. And also, um, one other thing is that every biz every big businesses you see today starts from started from somewhere. So it's not a bad thing to start small. 
it's not a bad thing to there's one lady that her story inspires me till today she's from my home country nigeria and um there's one delicacy that we do it it's a nigerian delicacy it's called my mind so it's it's prepared with beans and so this woman started that delicacy with um about two dollars so she she got sacked from her job she got fired and then she decided to when she was at her lowest moment she, the last money with her she decided to go buy ingredients with that money and then she made it just for her family and then she gave it to her neighbors and they loved it and everybody started saying can you make this for us and then that was how our business started and she's at a place in her business right now that she has uh, restaurants like wow. everywhere in the world just with two two dollars and she when michelle obama was the first lady she had an opportunity to meet with her and to serve her to serve michelle and moi moi that's delicacy wow. just with two dollars so one thing i learned from her is that no matter what even when you are your lowest moment an idea can come in that time don't take it for granted run with it and then use build whatsoever you have with all your art and then everything will work out well yeah thank you i'll just say that there's never been a better time to to start a business like with no code low code free or very close to free software to help you get started you know the, the longer you wait the less time you're going to have to refine Everything that we just heard is the truth, and it feels difficult to now have a different idea because that's exactly what, I, as an entrepreneur, I can tell you. Um, this social circle around you is very important, whether it's someone completely outside of the business so you can have some rest, or someone who is in, in a similar situation as you are, and that's something that has helped me tremendously, keeping in contact with on other chefs, other entrepreneurs, other restaurant owners, uh, kind of like a support group. Support groups are amazing, trust me. Um, so you can share knowledge together with people that you trust and that inspire you. Uh, you need someone to inspire you and to help you look like, oh, I can do that too. Um, balancing your life. Um, so you definitely are your biggest asset. Do not uh, underestimate yourself. So if you take care of yourself, you can continue. So don't try to do everything uh, and also value yourself because if that business venture fails, you still got you and you can still go and do something else with all the knowledge that you already have. Um, the last thing that I think I can, I can tell you is think about an, an I, uh, two things. I'll, um, just like uh, we say like, well, start right away. When you don't think you are ready, still do something. When COVID came, uh, I wasn't able to serve customers at a restaurant. Uh, there was a point where like, we were not even being able to know like, can, can I go, should I stay home? So what we started doing is start just recording cooking videos from my home kitchen and just put them in online. I wasn't making money out of that. That wasn't, like a business decision where it's like, oh, we can sell this. It was just like, keep doing what you love and eventually something will grow out from that. So what happened is people get to know us better and it's like, oh, like little people stop me on the street. It's like, hey, I've seen you on Instagram. Like you're the guy who's cooking online. Never before happened to me. But I, I am a strong believer that if you want something to happen, you gotta start working. Even if it's like in a cooking, cooking war, like, Cook for someone else, make a meal for, for someone else. Even if you don't make money out of that at the beginning, you are gonna start spinning that wheel that eventually is gonna get into something bigger. Uh, and the other thing is balance. Uh, and you know, the other thing I wanted to, to think about is like a lesson that I learned more recently. Uh, just because you, you are your biggest asset and you are not an eternal source of strength, power and might, you're gonna get tired. Think about processes that can help you have some rest, that can multiply your income, uh, because eventually you're gonna be tired. And I have a business that was based on my abilities, on my skills, and my work. And almost 10 years later, I tell you, I'm feeling tired. 
but now I'm, I'm starting to focus on how can I dedicate all this knowledge and, and experience that I have so it can continue to expand without me having to do everything myself. So you don't have to do it right away, but what, whatever you start that you feel like this is what I want to do, um, just keep in mind that eventually you want to be able to grow it without directly depending on everything that you do. Uh, one other thing I want to say is uh, it's uh, good to leverage on uh, the, the, let me say, the free monies you have out there, like grants. Yeah, because um, recently I won uh, a, a grant of $10,000 uh, by competing in a pitch competition where I pitched about my business and I won it. So, uh, and that's, trust me, that money went a long way in like sorting me out, <laughs> sorting the business out, like getting the space I am going to, lo I mean, open uh, in December and some other uh, building inventories and all that. So uh, you don't have to like have 100% of the money by yourself. Like there are so many uh, ways you can get monies out there, probably by uh, writing applications and all that. So try as much as possible to be on the lookout for this money so that it can help you to like start out. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much. That concludes our Career Week Entrepreneurship panel. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for any questions, but if anyone online or anyone here in person does have any questions, just email us at business at msbu.ca and uh, we will pass them along to our guest panelists. I'm sure they would be thrilled to answer any questions that you guys have, okay? I'd like to thank all of our panelists for taking the time, being here with us today and for sharing your wisdom. And uh, thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. We truly appreciate you all sharing your knowledge and experience, and we have a little token of appreciation. So thank you so much.